So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Summer Hargrist. church. 
As chancels do not require rededication or reconsecration unless the high altar was moved, it can confidently be stated that Bishop Dalderby ordered the complete rebuilding of the chancel to its current state in 1319. Thus, the 1317 transfer to the Abbey of Tame and its subsequent establishment of a vicarage in 1319 appear to have been the impetus for the rebuilding and redecoration of the chancel. Construction projects of this kind were typically carried out fairly quickly, and it is likely that the project was completed in the early 1320s or from about 1320 to 1325 to suggest a range. As the chancel paintings have been confirmed by conservators through technical analysis to be contemporary with the rebuilding of the chancel, these dates can also accurately be applied to the scheme. In his dissertation, Maynard states that the passage within the Dalderby Register may provide a reliable terminus post quem for the rebuilding of the chancel, but does not believe that the passage necessarily represents direct instruction for this work. Maynard provides no support for this hesitation, and while must, one must indeed be cautious in inferring the implications of passages such as these, there is no reason to suggest that the register was not here to be believed. Maynard proposes the building work was completed by 1328 or 29, when the wealthy local lord Drew Bereton II was buried here within the chancel. However, the register's indication that the Abbey of Tame was responsible for the rebuilding work calls the popular notion that the local Bereton family were patrons of the chancel scheme into question. A wealth of detailed information regarding the life and activities of Drew II has been compiled by archaeologist and historian John Blair. This work reveals that although Drew II owned large tracts of land elsewhere in England, his principal house was Chalgrove Manor, and Oxfordshire was clearly the main focus of his interests. Records suggest that until his death, Drew II, quote, performed the normal range of duties appropriate to a leading county gentleman, end quote, though no mention of his involvement in the construction or decoration work at Chalgrove Parish Church survives within archival sources. Archaeological investigations into the nearby site of the Bereton Manor House at Hardings Field connect Drew II with a phase of construction occurring around 1300 to 1330, in which the manor buildings were enlarged and modernized. The fact that this building work took place during the hypothesized period of the chancel's reconstruction has given cause for researchers to connect this local lord's actions with the funding of the project. In his dissertation, Maynard states that due to the information contained within the register, the idea of the Baritons having funded the church's building and decorative programs, quote, can probably no longer be entire, entertained in its entirety. Tame Abbey must have been responsible for the chancel to a considerable, if not a full, degree. However, Maynard states that the Bereton family, specifically Drew II, was possibly responsible for the chancel's lavish size and painting scheme. Maynard proposed that Drew II, as the first of six subsequent generations of Baritons to be buried in the chancel, fashion the space into a family mausoleum in ordinary imitation of contemporary noble dynasties. Simon Townley's A History of the County of Oxford, Volume 18, from 2016, follows this idea in stating that although Tame Abbey was possibly corporate rector, Drew II likely funded the lavish project from around 1310 to 1313 in order to create a family mausoleum. While it is not impossible that the Baritons were patrons of the scheme, no conclusive evidence has been located to support their involvement. Drew II was buried in the chancel likely shortly after the rebuilding and decoration of the space, but his burial does not necessarily serve as evidence of his earlier patronage. Possible visual evidence, however, has been noted by Bob Heath White, who suggests that female members of the Bereton family are represented in the South Wall scene depicting the Virgin alongside apostles and women before her death. The arguments for this, which are largely based upon assessment of the women's clothing, are compelling. It is difficult, however, to be certain of specific identification of these figures with historical personages similar to, um, as similar versions of this event in the Virgin's life are presented within both apocryphal texts and elsewhere within medieval art. There is evidence of neither heraldry within the scheme, as we might expect, or that the family incorporated enough female members to be depicted. Drew II is not recorded as having had any daughters. The reliable dating of the scheme to 1320 to 1325 
places the redecoration of the chancel within the term of Rector Nicholas of Litchfield, who began his service in 1313. By law, the rector of a parish church was responsible for the upkeep of the chancel. During the period of its reconstruction and decoration, however, Litchfield likely did not reside here in the area. The functioning of the church, including these rebuilding events, were likely therefore left to the resident parish vicar, Simon of Crowland, who served at the church as vicar from 1319 to 1333. Folio 173R of the Register states the Abbey of Tame was responsible for the chancel's books, vestments, and ornaments. As the term ornamenta could variously refer to decoration, embellishment, equipment, or marks of distinction, it may here reference the decoration of the new chancel. If so, this would provide further evidence that through the initial instruction by the Bishop of Lincoln in 1319, the chancel was rebuilt and ornamented by the Abbey of Tame in the early 1320s. Although the Abbey of, or Abbot of Team at the time would have been ultimately responsible for the rebuilding and decoration projects due to his rank, it was the Vicar Simon of Crowland who likely would have had a higher level of direct control over the projects. As can be deduced from his name, Simon of Crowland either personally came from or had familial ties to Crowland. This area of the Fenlands has been home, um, or had been home to the prominent Abbey of Crowland since the early Middle Ages. This is notable due to the stark similarities between the Childbrook paintings and the manuscripts within the Fenling Group, a group of East Anglican man illuminated manuscripts created around the first decade of the 14th century. Crowland has been proposed as one of the possible centers for the Fenling Group's production. These include, but are not limited to, the Ramsey, Goff, and Peterborough Psalters, which represent the focus of comparison within this paper. As art historian Lucy Freeman Sandler states, the Fenland manuscript artist, quote, worked in the same common style, shared the same pictorial models, and produced books for owners mainly in the same part of England, the Benedictine abbeys in the Fenlands. Although they do not share identical format or imagery, the manuscripts have an exceedingly similar style. This lively style is also apparent here at the Chalbrook scheme. The Chalbrook paintings correlate to each of these individual Psalters in varying fashion. For instance, here on this slide, slide, you can see how the death, assumption, and coronation of the Virgin at Chalbrook are especially similar to the sequence within the Ramsey Psalter, including the presence of Saints John the Baptist and John the Evangelist, who are not shown on this slide, but are present in the window displays on the south wall, located between the death and the burial of the Virgin. The positioning of the figure's bodies in the child growth depiction of the descent from a cross is strikingly similar to that within the Ramsey and Peterborough Psalters. Note the positioning of the figure's bodies. Christ's arms are at the exact same angle and Mary's head at the same tilt. Frequently, the comp composition of the child growth scenes is nearly identical to those within all three of the Fenland Psalters. For example, the flagellation of Christ is missed like that within the Goth Psalter, but is still very similar to representations within the Ramsey and Peterborough Psalters. Just as none of the Fenland group manuscripts are identical to one another, the childbirth sequence is not identical to any one of the Fenland manuscripts. I argue that their similarities in both style and content, however, are strong enough to conclude that the childbirth paintings were created by a workshop influenced by the style and compositions of the Fenland manuscripts. Whether this was due to the hired workshop's proximity to the Fenland Manuscripts Center of Production, or through direct influence and instruction by the vicar Simon of Crowland, cannot be ascertained. Documentation providing evidence for the existence of design sharing between illuminated manuscript and mural, mural workshops has yet to be discovered, but the direct influence of illuminated, illuminated manuscripts upon several English medieval wall painting schemes has been cited. It is here appropriate to propose the former existence of an early 14th century manuscript belonging to the Fenland group that contained an extended Marian sequence and was used as a blueprint for the Chalbrook paintings. Chalbrook's vicar, Simon of Crowland, may have had access to such a manuscript and proposed its use in the creation of the chancel paintings. Alternatively, the Chalbrook paintings may have been influenced by multiple manuscript sources, or yet differently, Multiple manuscript sources may have influenced design, designs created at the hired workshop, 
which in turn ch shaped the childbirth imagery without the influence of the vicar. An important aspect to consider with regards to the chancel imagery is the church's dedication to St. Mary the Virgin, beginning in the year 1279, when the church was reconsecrated re around, around 1320 to 1325, it likely retained this original dedication, which would explain the scheme's intense focus upon the life and death of the Virgin Mary. In his 1946 publication, historian, historian K. E. Kirk highlighted an apparent consecration of, concentration of churches dedicated to the Assumption of the Virgin in Oxfordshire. Childbirth was included in this list, although it is uncertain whether the church was dedicated specifically to the, to the Assumption. Kirk hypothesizes that a pilgrimage route existed in this area, leading along the way to either Walsingham or another shrine to the Virgin, located in either Western England or East Anglia. Childbirth is placed along his theoretical route. Although Kirk's theory requires more documentary evidence, the existence of a pilgrimage route would likely have acted as a motive for Tame Abbey to fund a painting scheme imbued with poignant images of the Virgin for devotional purposes and potentially economic gain. Although views of the ch of Childbirth's chancel would have been largely blocked from the ladies' view by a rude screen, on offering days such as Easter, parishioners would have been allowed past this divider during the offertory to give monetary donations. If there was indeed a pilgrimage route, the Abbey of Tame may have had these paintings created under the management of Simon Crowland in order to draw visitors to the church and raise funds. If this was indeed the case, it is plausible that Sir Drew the Barret Drew Barrington II chose to be buried in this chancel space in order to connect himself to its recently heightened importance. To end this presentation, I will briefly note the possibility that the chancel was also considered a fitting space to reflect contemporary diocesan politics. The general resurrection scene on the south wall features a pope, identified by his three-tiered papal tiara, and a bishop both of which are shown resurrecting from the center of the top row of tombs. Situated near, nearest to Christ, these figures are pictorially placed first in line for salvation. In 1320, just one year after giving instructions for the rebuilding of Childrose Chancel, Bishop John Dalderby of Lincoln died, and his position was filled by Henry Burgersh through a controversial papal provision. Through the petition of Burgersh's politically active uncle, King Edward II persuaded Pope John XXI to appoint Burgersh to the position. Historian Nicholas Bennett states that, quote, contemporary chroniclers were almost universally critical of Burgersh's appointment, the papal position, provision, and the king's intervention by which he had gained the see were particularly denounced. Some even hinted that money had been paid. It was also said that Burgersh was too young and lacked the qualifications necessary for the episcopate and pope. Although papal provisions for episcopal appointments were fairly common in this period, well-connected viewers of the childbirth scene would likely have been reminded of these controversial events when viewing the scene. While it cannot be proven that these figures were meant to represent specific individuals, the painting may refer to them indirectly through its representation of the offices of the pope and the bishop. The scene certainly represents the offices' close relationship to one another and God, and through this may have been intended to highlight their legitimacy. Further, their inclusion may point to ecclesiastical influence upon the formation of the scheme. In conclusion, the major contribution of this presentation is the setting forth of a reliable date window for the creation of the chancel paintings, around 1320 to 1325 based upon the statements contained within the contemporary Episcopal registers. I have also noted the strong connections that exist between the childbirth paintings and the Fenland Psalter group, and proposed the possible influence of Vicar Simon of Crowland upon the scheme. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to hearing you back.